We are live. What's good in the hood, boys? What's going on, peeps? How are we doing? Sean, what's going on? Isaac, what's happening? Doing a little bit of research on the meaning of music today. What's going on, Chris? Connor, what's going on? Literally, as you're going to sleep, sorry, buddy. Hey, Judas, what's happening? Just going to wait a second for some people to pop in here before we start. But I guess I can give a little bit of a recap while we're waiting. So last time I was kind of trying to outline the different elements of music that we could analyze, what makes up, you know, music as we understand it, at least in the West. Um, and I would say for the most part, this also applies to any other um, culture's music practices that they would probably use different words. Um, we also dove into Perlovsky's Music and Cognition, which is actually where we left off. And we started digging into Pluchik's Wheel of Emotions, which I spelled Pluchik wrong. There we go. Pluchik's Wheel of Emotions. And I got some notes taken down here. But before we get into all that, I at least want to say hi to you guys in chat for a moment. Billy Bob, what's going on, man? Hey, Ezio, what's happening? Padge, what's going on, dude? How we be, peeps? To do this video series that I'd like to do on emotions, it's going to take a shitload of research. <laughs> hey, no, what's going on? And in order to do that research, it's going to take a lot of time. So I figure why not share some of that with you guys at the same time? Twenty two be twenty two reasons to be a, mu a musician because the world needs something right now. <laughs> it's good musicians. Yeah. Well, if any of the reasons I said doesn't scare you, then you should be all right. So don't worry about it. Hey, hey, Killbot, what's going on, dude? Ashley, what's going on? If you watch the end of the video, I said I have no regrets. So. Uh, I don't have TikTok. I. I went on a tirade to today's video explaining why I hate TikTok. I guess I didn't even explain why I hate TikTok, just stating that I did. What's going on, Seaman? How are we doing? Hey, Mateus. All right. Yeah, these are probably going to be very small uh, attended streams, but that's fine. At least it's here for posterity. So, having said that, let's hop into it. Um, I jumped into the elements of what makes up music. I thought timbre, pitch, harmony, melody, rhythm, repetition, articulation. It doesn't even necessarily need repetition, I would say. I mean, it really doesn't need all of these different elements to it, but these are all elements that can characterize it. Um, and repetition is a very normal part of music. So I figured we'd just at least include that. Can you guys think of any other elements in there in chat? I know I asked you guys last time, but, you know, who knows? Maybe there's some, some more ideas. Um, and we also went through Pluchik's Wheel of Emotions, which I have uh, right here. Oh, you can't see that well at all. Hold on. No, no, stop, stop, stop. Okay. New tab. This is not super helpful. How do we zoom in? Damn it, how do we zoom in? I guess for this one, we could just do this. Yeah, there we go. All right. So we have our base emotions here on the second the uh, second tier of the wheel. 
anger as opposed to fear, anticipation as opposed to surprise, joy as opposed to sadness, disgust as opposed to trust. So that's part of what we dove into. And we were able to break down what emotions are actually useful for. So we found out from reading the stuff on Pluchik that emotions are constructs or ideas that help describe a certain experience. Emotions evaluate concepts for the purpose of instinct satisfaction. That's not like the world's most complicated words, but all of those words have a lot of implications each on their own. And so it's very dense language, I would say. Um, but basically, I broke it down to the way the way that emotions kind of work here is you get your stimulus, you get whatever whatever stimulates the body that goes into an interpretation stage of your brain that goes into an assessment stage. So basically, you take in the stimulus, your brain has to interpret what that stimulus was. If I touch myself in that instance, I feel something touching the skin but I don't actually feel it until the signal goes through the neural pathways to the brain and the brain interprets it that I felt it. So you have the stimulus itself, which is the act of touching, and then the brain realizing it's been touched. An assessment of what that means. This just changed my idea of what the known universe is. This just changed my, my environment and my conception of being. So I need to assess the extent to which that impacts my my purpose my what i'm doing you know how how this impacts me and then that triggers an emotion that emotion creates the motivation for a decision or action so yeah Con not super complicated but again pretty dense pretty pretty dense Harmony and dissonance. I would say dissonance is, is uh, an aspect of harmony. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Ah, shit. Sorry about that. My microphone came unplugged for half a second. Sorry about that, boys. Just saw that. Sorry. Um, but someone was saying about the timbre, or sorry, about feel. About feel being a part of the, the whole process. I was saying that I think feel is really a combination of articulation and rhythm. Uh, so I wouldn't include that personally. Sorry about the mix up there, peeps. The intentional lesson and interpretation of facial expressions. <laughs> like a full minute. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, it's not something I can actually hear in my own in my own head right now because I'm on different headphones than uh, where I'm capturing sound from. Repeat everything. <laughs> okay. 
Um, someone asked if if feel should be included here as an element of music, if I want to be more abstract. But I was saying that um, articulation, I think, is what most people consider feel because it's how you craft timbre and how you craft a sound envelope, uh, as well as rhythm. It's where you place the notes relative to the anticipation of people's uh, ec uh, rhythmic expectations. So I think, I think that's what people interpret as feel, which I still think is kind of a bullshit term. Um, but either way, yeah, that's all I would say. Either way. So that's about as far as we got through here. Also, for some reason, we needed to learn about organ. Oh, that's right. There was a definition for emotions, which was a change in most or all of the organ organismic subsystems. Uh, sy synchronized? Synchronously? Something like that? I don't know. That kind of sounded like a shitload of... I don't want to say bullshit, because I don't think it's bullshit. I think it's a little bit more biological than I feel like getting right now. <laughs> I'm looking for more psychological, which gets closer to this, this area of things. But I do definitely want to dive into the biology of things. But this is like some higher level biology. Um, either way, I want to jump back in to the... Cognitive Function of Music, Part 1. Uh, we'll do a little recap here. By uh, Leonid, or Leonid, I don't know how the fuck to pronounce that name, Perlovsky. Either way, ancient and contemporary theories of cognitive functions of music, its origins and evolution are reviewed. A hypothesis is presented that promises to unify the field, and a theory is proposed of the origin of music, based on the fundamental role of music in cognition. The split is considered of the vocalizations of proto-humans into two types, one less emotional and one more concretely, or sorry, one less emotional and more concretely semantic, evolving into language, and the other preserving emotional connections along, the semantic, along with semantic in ambiguity, evolving into music. So basically like old pre-evolved humans had two types of vocalizations. One that was something that was close to what we consider music, one that was closer to something that we consider language. The evolution of language towards the semantically powerful tool of today required emanci emancipation from emotional encumbrances. Uh, like I described before, the, the semantics of the word can. You can tell this is a can. That the, the fact that the word can means something like this has no emotional gravity to it. The only emotional gravity a definition like that could have is subjective to the experiences of the individual who is using that term for whatever reason. But in a completely isolated world, can. This is a can, and there's no emotion attached to it. That's what can means. Uh, or, you know, flip side, you could strip the semantic utility of the word can by using it a shitload of times uh, rhythmically and put the pitch of it up and down in a, in a pattern that people can recognize, and then that starts to become music. Uh, either way, that's actually just interesting throwing that out there as something I probably want to use in a video. Um, Either way, emancipation from emotional encumbrances. Opposing, but no less powerful, mechanisms required, and that means like our mental mechanisms, required a compensatory evolution. That means a, a, an evolution that compensates for the evolution of language, uh, of music towards more differentiated and refined emotionality. 100% agree. Uh, the need for refined music is grounded in fundamental mechanisms of the mind. This is why today's human mind and cultures cannot exist without today's music. The hypothesis is that the fundamental cognitive function of music is to help resolve cognitive dissonances created by language. Because 
we are emotional beings, but because we have to work with uh, a communication method that is so detached from how emotional we are, we need the development of more relative to our ancestors, more complex music in order to resolve the cognitive dissonances created by how dry, emotionally dry our language is. I'm pretty sure is what he's trying to get across there, but I could be wrong. Uh, we're going to continue reading though. Without this ability, evolution of language, cognition, culture is not possible. So there we go. Um, we were down through here. We had touched through. He's basically saying all of these people who are like, music's just a thing that scratches an itch. And he's about to just be like backhanding all of these motherfuckers who are just making all these assumptions. I mean, shit, I make assumptions all the time. We all do. That's the thing about emotions and music is there's a shitload of assuming that we do and a whole lot that we don't know. Uh, here we review a hypothesis based on arguments from cognitive science and mathematical models of the mind, suggesting that music serves the most important and concrete function in evolution of the mind and cultures. We elucidate this function and discuss the neural mechanisms behind it, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So as we read further into this, well, hold on, before, before we go any further, I'm going to check chat really quick to make sure we're all coming along here, see what's going on. It's pronounced Lena. Oh, thank you so much, Connor. Uh, someone say tool. Yes, they did say tool. Steven Pinker, and the, actually Steven Pinker is referenced in this paper, thinks music is just a byproduct of evolutionary forces and calls music auditory cheesecake. Yeah, well, good, good for fucking Steven Pinker. I also bet he can't play an instrument for jack shit. <clears throat> that would be the can can exactly like the badger song yes badgers 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 mushroom mushroom precisely connor the only thing that that cements the semantic meaning of the word badger in that song is the fact that there are literally badgers popping up on the screen when you watch the dumb little video but yes it's exactly like that a call music language of sound which makes it inherently subjective no Language is the language of sound because we're fucking speaking at Billy Bob. <laughs> I'm literally speaking to it to you in your head. When you read things on a piece of paper, a lot of times you get vocalizations or aud or audiations of someone actually speaking it to you. So lang language is just a, as much about sound as it is um, as it is uh, as music is. On top of that, just because it's the length, quote unquote about sound does not mean it's inherently subjective. How we interpret it can be highly subjective, but that doesn't mean that you are, that it, it doesn't resonate objectively in most people a similar way. Uh, are those same people that say all music is derivative in some way? I mean, fucking all music is derivative in some way. It has to be. Just, just by the, the simple axiom of cause and effect being a thing. You can't escape that. That doesn't mean that all mu that doesn't mean that all music is negatively derivative, but I mean all all music is derivative. It has to be. That's that's part of the beauty of the evolution of music. Uh, love your channel. You're the coolest. But let me just say, I'm from Florida. Painter, just have a moment of silence for thirty seconds. It's all for. Uh, I can't say I'm familiar with that man, but either way, appreciate you and thanks for the comment. Uh, music is the inner power that you can have. Can't say I know what the hell you're talking about. Hey, Mike, what is the best advice for getting good at understanding and applying music theory? <sighs> music praxis. Music theory is all the shit that you learn from all of the um, explanations of how things work together. Music praxis is actually using them together in real life. So it's like um, having a class versus having a lab. Also, a lot of times known as ear training. When, when I do Song Suggestion Friday and I'm sitting here listening to music and bitching about things, that is a form of music praxis. That's a form of music lab, believe it or not. Um, it, it's a lot more useful 
if you know how to interpret the theory that you learn and kind of use that in your in your form of analysis and use it as a way of helping you better understand things but yeah you could call that a form of music praxis all right let's continue on all right so we're still recapping here the mind understand the work understands the world in the terms of concepts. Concepts are neural representations that operate as mental models of objects and situations. Let me repeat that. We understand the world as concepts. Concepts are neural representations that operate as mental models of objects and situations. So basically, we, we need a way of making nouns, making things into nouns, concepts, or making things into things that we can grasp somewhat. So our brain has to make a model of it in order for us to grasp it. Um, <clears throat> during visual perception of an object, a concept model in the mind memory projects an image onto the visual cortex, which is matched there to an image projected from the retina. Instincts are mechanisms of survival that are much more ancient than mechanisms of concepts. The mechanism of instincts is similar to the internal sensors that measure vital organs, uh, vital organism parameters and indicates when they are out of safe range. Uh, for example, a low, a low blood sugar level indicates an instinctual need for food. Da 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 da. All right. So emotions designate a number of various mechanisms. We consider emotions as neural signals connecting instinctual and conceptual brain regions, which I believe we talked about here. This, I assume, fits more. Okay, this absolutely fits more in the instinctual, stimulus and interpretation. I believe the assessment does as well, but then the motivation and then decision and action I guess this could all fit under instinctual at some point. Um, but either way, let's continue with uh, Perlovsky here. Uh, okay, so they connect instinctual and conceptual brain regions. Emotions communicate instinctual needs to conceptual recognition, communicate instinctual needs to conceptual recognition understanding mechanisms. Okay, that makes sense. So... Your, your instincts are telling you something and that elicits an emotion that then talks to your brain. So, so an emotion is even a concept in and of itself, which I believe we had over here. Emotions are constructs or ideas, yeah, which we could also describe as concepts. Uh. Uh, can potentially satisfy instinctual needs, receive preferential attention and processing resources within the brain. Thus, emotions evaluate concepts for their purpose of instinct satisfaction. That is awfully interesting. Sorry. Emotions, emotions evaluate concepts for the purpose of instinct satisfaction. Did I write that down? Yeah, I did. Okay. That's not from Pluchek. That's from Perlovsky. So I'm going to... I think that's actually where we left off. Oop. Perlovsky. Okay. Back to it. Psychological. Now we're now we're heading into new territory. Psychological research of emotions is usually limited to basic emotions, which are named by words related to satisfaction of bodily instinctual needs, and limited in number to a few different emotions. Those are all his citations. Um, <clears throat> this review emphasizes that a few basic emotions are a tiny part of our emotional abilities. This review emphasizes that a few that a few basic emotions are just a tiny part of our emotional abilities, although the most ancient and salient ones. Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. Our higher cognitive abilities involve a virtually 
a virtual infinity of continuous emotions, which are not described by specific words and include emotions in the prosody of voice. I don't even know that word. I'm going to look that word up. Prosody, the pattern of rhythm and sound used in poetry. Okay, let me read this again. Which are not described by specific words and include emotion in the prosody of voice, emotions of cognitive dissonances, which we briefly describe later, as well as music. This is the longest fucking run on sentence. That's one sentence. That's bullshit. There is no fucking way that needs to be that long. I don't care what the fuck he is saying. I don't care how sciencey this guy is trying to be. Holy shit. Oh, gosh. Oh. Okay. Sorry, I'm taking a look at chat here. Is this a four credit class? <laughs> it's about to be a lot more than, than credits, my man. Ugh. I missed the second definition. What's the second definition? The area of study of prosody, patterns of stress, intonation, and language. Yeah, that's pretty much what I was getting out of it. The patterns of stress and intonation in language. That's, that's exactly what I was pulling out of it. All right, let's read this sentence again. This review emphasizes that a few basic emotions are a tiny part of emotional abilities are the most ancient salient ones. All right, cool. So never mind. That's one sentence. That's still a fucking long sentence. So basic emotions are a very small part of our emotional abilities, but are like the most ancient ones and the ones that we're most aware of. Our higher cognitive abilities involve a virtual infinity of continuous emotions. So basically an infinite number of emotions we could possibly feel is what he's claiming. Our higher cognitive abilities, uh, which are not described by specific words. Okay and include emotions in the, in the uh, prosody of voice, emotions of cognitive dissonances. Okay. Impro include emotions in the prosody of voice, how we speak. There, there, there are, there's an emotionality to how we speak in order to more effectively communicate the semantic information that we're talking about. As I'm speaking right now, there's even emphasis and there's pitch. Like you could even draw a melody with my pitch. There's literally people who make YouTube careers out of uh, making harmony, like jazz harmony to people's voices. Um, okay. So include the prosody of voice, emotions of cognitive dissonances. I could see that, um, which we briefly describe later, as well as musical emotions, the main topic of this review. All right. Musical emotions. That's interesting. Uh, conceptual emotional understanding of the world results in bodily actions and actions within the mind. Conceptual, God damn it. Conceptual emotional understanding of the world results in bodily actions and actions of the mind. Is this necessary to say? I feel like that's a, for granted. We only touch on the behavior of improving understanding and knowledge the behavior inside the mind directed at improving concepts. I'm guessing he's talking about in this review or he's talking about in general, I'm not sure. Give, given references describe how this theory of conceptual emotional recognition and understanding encompass, encompasses the mechanisms of intuition, imagination, planning, conscious, unconscious, and many others, including aesthetic emotions. This is very dense. This is annoyingly dense. Here we touch on one mechanism referred to later. For example, visual imagination occurs when one completes, uh, contemplates objects or situations with closed eyes, All right? Touch on one mechanism referred to later. 
The visual imagination occurs when one contemplates objects or situations with closed eyes. Yeah, we, we get some sort of visual that goes along with it. Uh, contemplated concept models project images onto the visual cortex. Okay, causing visual imagination. Okay, the initial part of this process, say the first 70 minutes, can never be accessed by consciousness. Uh, I don't know that I agree with that, but okay. The initial concept model projections from memory onto the visual cortex are vague, and the human mind is not conscious of them. Only when concept model projections match object projections from the retina and become crisp do conscious projections occur. Okay, this whole paragraph, why does this keep selecting way more than I'm asking for? This whole paragraph is beyond me, I will have to say. That's far more dense than, than I'm willing to dive into right now. Basically, for some reason, he's saying that our conscious mind can't project visual models onto the brain, as I'm assuming he's saying, as well as the unconscious mind. I don't fucking know. I do not fucking know at all. I, I don't understand what he's trying to say here. And I would love for a goddamn source, you're citing all of this other shit, and you're just going to drop this fucking load and not cite anything? Okay. Um, the, the knowledge instinct. All right. To satisfy instinctual needs, example, eating or procreation, the mind must first perceive a variety of surrounding objects as well as understand specific situations. Yeah, of course. As, di as discussed, this task requires matching concept models to the surroundings. Yeah, I agree. But the surrounding objects never exactly match old concept model memories. How, how do you know this? <laughs> I don't... Where, where did you get this? <laughs> Angles, lighting, and the positions of objects are always different. I mean, technically, they're not exactly the same, but you also can't predict the future. So, okay, sure. Uh, this has presented difficulties in developing artificial intelligence and cognitive models. Okay, that makes sense. Sure, sure, what, whatever you say. It, it, you're, he's talking about down to, like, the infinitesimal detail, which makes sense why it's hard for um, people to make AI, or one of the many reasons. The significant progress only made recently... Uh, the initial projections of concept models are vague, and they approximately match many different objects. Okay. Oh, okay, that's the issue. They approximately match many different objects. But the issue is we, we I don't even know, I guess the best way of putting it is we start with intent, but I don't even think that's it either. You can program intent into a fucking robot. That's the easy part. Getting it to accurately execute that is, is completely different. Um... To actually perceive specific objects, the mind has to modify concepts so that they fit concrete objects and situations present in the ever-changing world. Okay, yeah. That makes sense. Uh, this mechanism operates independently of our desire to perceive it. Oh, or to perceive, rather. It is an inborn autonomous mechanism, more fundamental than eating or procreation. This, this is diving into stuff that I wasn't even expecting to dive into. I want to know how the fuck this ties into music. Um, it is aimed at satisfying a basic need to understand the world around us by making concept models similar to the surroundings. The mind has an inborn instinct that senses this similarity and maximizes the similarity. Okay. Uh, this mechanism is called the knowledge instinct. Interesting. Knowledge is the measure of correspondence between concepts in the world. Knowledge is the measure of correspondence between concepts in the world. Oh, I am absolutely writing that down. That's beautiful. Whoa, too large. That's what she said. All right. Yes, they should probably stomp louder upstairs. That's the most nice thing to do. Uh, Perlovsky word. I really like that sentence a lot. 
All right. And then hold on, because we had a definition of concepts up here. And then concepts are neural representations that operate as mental models of objects and situations. Yeah. Yeah. Those two work together. I have a funny feeling since these are these statements are all building off of one another, and for some reason he's going on a fucking rant, a good rant, <laughs> about um, the relationship between concepts and now diving into knowledge and understanding this whole thing is about music. These are probably going to be important. Concepts are neural representations that operate as mental models of objects and situations. Knowledge is the measure of correspondence between concepts and the world. Interesting. That's going to take some time for me to sink in. Uh, but either way, going back down to here. All right. I'm going to take a brief pause here and hop over to chat just to see how far everyone is following along. <clears throat> yeah, they get awfully fucking stompy up there. What is the purpose of these particular live streams? Some sort of self-made assignment? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's the best way of putting it. <clears throat> so I did a video not too long ago. Um, basically expressing what I thought a deeper, more fundamental meaning was of one of the most basic chord progressions we have, <clears throat> which may not even be specific to that chord progression in and of itself but of how we use um, specific kinds of chord progressions. And I was like, hey, I want to make more videos like this and, uh, and make a series that goes into trying to understand the meaning of music outside of its um, semantic context when you start adding words to it and shit. Like... <laughs> You can add words to, to describe music. We describe music as dark, we describe music as happy, we describe music as sad, and that has nothing to do with the words that are used, that are associated with it. We can, we can plant emotions or even just the word tension to music. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 you're good, Rebecca. I wasn't meaning that in any bad way. Just explaining. Um, yeah, but it's going to take a shitload of research and time for me to learn about this stuff. And I figured it'd be a good way to, uh, to share some more content with you guys is learning it together at the same time. Um, but yeah, either way, uh, emotions that evaluate satisfaction or dissatisfaction of this instinct are felt as harmony and disharmony between the knowledge of the world. Okay. Emotions that evaluate satisfaction or dissatisfaction of this instinct, okay, are felt as harmony or disharmony between the knowledge and the world. That's fucking cool as hell. That actually does make sense to me. Okay. I'm going to save that boy too. Dude, this guy has massive, massive PP statements right now. word may us continue they are not related directly to lower bodily needs but only to higher need for knowledge they are not related director directly to lower bodily needs but only to higher need for knowledge hmm interesting in this sense they are higher spiritual aesthetic emotions Huh. Gonna need to, I'm going to need to mull that over for a good minute, too, honestly. Uh, either way, let's keep going. 
It is in this way that Kant explained the emotion of the beautiful. However, Kant <clears throat> could not complete his explanation because he did not consider that the need to constantly adapt concept because he did not consider the need to constantly adapt concept models. He did not know about knowledge what what was it? Uh, knowledge instinct. He didn't know about knowledge instinct. Satisfaction of knowledge instinct we feel as aesthetic emotions. Okay. Which are inseparable from every act of perception and cognition. Wow. This is this is a lot to take in. <laughs> this is a lot to take in. They're in the perception of everyday objects. Those emotions usually are below the threshold of conscious registration. Uh, those emo these emotions, okay. But it is easy to prove experimentally that emotional neural signals are there. Okay, cool. As as soon as the perception and understanding of the surrounding world does not work. We feel disharmonious. Okay, I like that. Disturbed or even threatened. This is routine material for movie thrillers, which present situations that do not fit our concept models. Fucking A. I'm going to have to go back through this off stream, but this is fucking cool. This is my favorite paragraph thus far. That and then even the last one's really good too. There's a lot of good shit there. But yeah, I'm not going to be able to fully um, digest all of this on stream right now. Oh, I highly recommend everyone read this. Um, it's Music and Cognition. That's what it's, that's the name of the paper. Uh, Cognitive Function of Music. There we go. By uh, however the fuck you pronounce this dude's name, Perlovsky. There's only part one. I don't know where the fuck part two is. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's from Harvard University. It's from Cambridge. So it's not a pushover. Whoops, where do we leave off? Okay, I think it was here. The hierarchy of the mind. The mind does not follow a strict hierarchy, but for simplicity, we use the word hierarchy in this review. Okay. Uh, at every level of the hierarchy top-down signals generated by concept models are matched to bottom-up signals from the concept models recognized and understood at lower levels. Okay, that lost me. Let me see if I can slow that down so I can pick up everything that was dropped there. At every level of the hierarchy, top-down signals generated by concept models, the things that we put in our brain, are matched to bottom-up signals coming from concept models recognized and understood at lower levels. Okay, they're, they're matched. The mind involves a hierarchy of multiple levels from simple perceptual elements. So there's edges or moving dots to concept models of objects to complex scenes up the hierarchy towards the highest concept models. The highest concept models near the top of the hierarchy are essential for understanding the meaning of life. Okay, I think I, I think I get where he's going at now. Uh, nature of the beautiful of the beautiful and spiritual spiritually sublime. Okay. I can I can I can see where he's heading at here now. Okay. To, to understand this, let us first attend to the perception cognition of a simple situation scene, say an office of a professor. Uh, knowledge instinct drives us to understand the office in its unity of constituent objects. A mathematical model of this process was developed in... Okay, I guess he's just saying, he's just citing it. He's, there's a mathematical process of the knowledge instinct driving us to fucking find some unity in the fucking objects that are all there that make it the office for an understanding of what an office is. Uh, for understanding higher, le higher level abstract concepts, 
we have corresponding concept models, i.e. an office. So yeah, that's what he's basically trying to say. Like when we think of an office as an object, it has a shitload of other concept models within it, like the phone, the computer desk, the books, the professor, the chair, all these other things. So this higher level concept in quotes of an of a professor's office has within it shitloads of other concept models could be like um different types of uh what do you call it shelving it could be a hard floor a carpeted floor you know it could be a bunch of other things things that things that were um we would say the similarity to that is it has a floor that is most likely really old and shitty <laughs> That's that's the similarity between the concept model and reality when you walk into a professor's office. It's almost always going to be a shitty floor. Okay. Similarly, we understand a concert hall and other abstract concept models owing to models for this purpose. All right. Let me repeat this word. Purpose. Every concept model evolved in genetic and cultural evolution and an individual learning with a purpose. Okay, so everything... All of our concept models become that with a purpose. Okay. Thousand percent on board with that. This purpose is to make a unified sense out of many lower level concepts. Okay. So the unified sense that he's talking about is unifying all the lower level concepts into a higher level concept. Unifying the the desk with the computer with the phone with the person to a higher level concept this is motherfucker's office all right that's the purpose this process lower level concepts acquire higher level sense something more meaningful than their lower level meanings okay in this way our understanding of the world can move from a book to an office to a university to an educational system and so on to concepts near the top of our minds. Okay. These concepts attempt to make sense to understand the meaning of our entire experience. We understand, feel them as related to the meaning and purpose of our lives. Okay. This is actually starting to make sense to me. As we're going through it, this is starting to make more clarity. So your lower level concepts aren't coming from the lower level part of your brain. It's just the, the lower level concepts. So like, th this is plastic the, these keys here are plastic but then the plastic is made up of the keys and there's many of them together I, I see many of these keys on here and then i see the frame and then all of these concepts come together as a keyboard and then this keyboard is sitting on this piece of wood which happens to be my little my little lap desk you know and this this becomes all, all of these with all the other shit in here becomes my my room that i that i work out of so, yeah, okay, this is making sense. And we can evolve that up to the complex, to the city of Nashville, to Tennessee, to the United States, to the world, to our particular solar system. You know, you can keep leveling up the concepts and everything that comes within it. But also, I think that also has to do with your relation to all of these different concepts, potentially. Um, I need to step away and use the restroom very quickly, but enjoy this music and chat amongst yourselves very quick, and I'll come back and say hi to chat. Be our bizzle.
Okay. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, this, this is starting to make some sense to me. How are you guys feeling? Hey, Kevo. You say that music is being, or rather, would I say that music is the creative and sonic mathematic equation of the soul, or basically the sound of the soul? Uh, depends upon how you define soul. And also, um, <clears throat> I don't like using the word math to describe music, if possible. You can use math to uh, quantify uh, empirically what's happening with a sound. And that's very helpful for reproducing or for understanding what you just made. But I don't think that math has any direct correlation or meaning to why music becomes meaningful to us. Um, as far as, you know, like you said, the soul, I mean, there, there's multiple ways of, of um, defining or interpreting that word. But I don't think this is a terrible definition. I, I just, I would definitely take the mathematic out of it. Maybe a sonic equation. Uh, uh, Sonic expression of the soul. I would go with that. But then you also have to define soul. Maybe maybe psyche. I don't know. But frankly, I mean, I don't know nearly enough to nail it down myself. And anyone who does is most likely lying. But <laughs> anywho, say love you. All right. Language. I don't I don't think music is a language as much as Steve Vai and Victor Wooten want to <clears throat> want to say it is. I I disagree with that statement. I think it's definitely communication, but I don't think it's language. Um which, I mean, <clears throat> even though I, I disagree with their fundamental premise, I think that the ideas that they have for how communication happens through music is fucking gorgeous. Um, either way. So, where were we? The dual hierarchy of cognition and language. All right. The mind hierarchy is discussed above tacitly, uh, uh, as discussed above tacitly assumes a single hierarchy of cognitive models. To get closer to understanding musical emotions, we now consider the dual hierarchy of cognition and language following... Okay, that's, that's, a, whole, that's a whole other thing that I have no fucking clue about. The dual hierarchy of cognition and language. I want to try and see if I can interview this fucking dude. If this guy is still alive, which he sh hopefully he still is, I want to see if I can interview this guy and just be like, hey, can you can you express this for, like stupid people talk for me and for my audience? <laughs> and he, can you boil this down into some great examples that I can be like, oh, OK, <laughs> OK. Uh. We now have to consider the dual hierarchy of cognition and language. Okay. The appreciation that cognition and language are not the same. Okay. Cognition and language are not the same. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. That these abilities are served by different mechanisms of the mind began a revolution in the 20th century linguistics initiated by Chomsky. As in Noam Chomsky? No. Hold on. I'm going to find this real quick. Okay. Many, many psycholinguists and evolutionary linguists today disagree with Chomsky. Okay. Um, so it's not the same Chomsky. It's just some random ass dude named Chomsky. Chomsky's complete separation of language and cognition and the denial of the evolutionary or origin of language. Okay. And he cites his work there. Here we summarize only the conclusions that are important for understanding the function of music. Okay. 
how does cognition interact with language? Language is so important for thinking that it is difficult to comprehend what cognition would be without language. Fully on board with that statement. Children typically acquire language by about the age of five. <clears throat> by seven, they can talk about <clears throat> much of the content of culture. Hmm. But they cannot act as adults. What exactly is missing in terms of neural mechanisms? How do children learn which words and sentences correspond to which objects and situations? Some people master language very well, while inept in the real... Whoops. Some people... Some people master language very well, while inept in the real world or when interacting with other people. Contrary examples also abound. So what are the mechanisms that make language and cognition so in interdependent and at the same time so separate? What, and what exactly are animals missing that they cannot learn language? Okay. The main mechanism of interaction between cognition and language, according to the given references, is a dual concept model. Okay, I think that's what he's talking about here. So there's a concept model for language and there's one separate for cognition. Is that what he's talking about? The main mechanism of interaction between cognition and language, according to the given references, is a dual concept model. Each concept has two parts, the language part, a word or phrase, and the cognitive part, an object or situation. Okay. Okay. I don't know that I fully understand, but I'm just going to roll with it for now. When a child is born, these are vague neural placeholders that later acquire concrete content. Okay. By the age of five, most of the language models are crisp, clear, and conscious but the corresponding cognitive models may remain vague and unconscious. Corresponding cognitive, okay, okay. That, may, that, that makes a little sense to me. You can learn words without having a proper concept model of what the fuck they mean. <clears throat> that makes sense to me. Like, just babies just saying dad, da dad, da dad, 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 da dad, da They might not even have a full concept of what the fuck dad means. Or even that they're talking about this weird looking dude who keeps changing my diapers. But when they keep using that phrase and then this dude comes over, they start to cement a, um, a fucking connection between the two, I would assume. I don't fucking know. I don't even know at that point. But that's the guess I'm trying to make here as an example for the separation between cognition and language hierarchies. That, that actually makes a little sense to me. Also explains why I can't fucking read well and think at the same time. Um, all right. Where were we? Children typically acquire blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> what exactly is missing in terms of the blah, 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 object situations? Some people master language, blah, blah, blah. Main mechanism or interaction, dual concept model. Sorry, I, I was down here. Okay. The reason is that individual learning of language relies on the surrounding language, which contains models of language ready-made. Yes, okay, that makes sense. By the age of four, everyone knows, example, about good guys and bad guys, but who can claim at 30 or 40 or 70 that he or she can use these concepts in, in real life error-free? That makes sense. Uh, well... I know a certain political uh, faction that thinks that they can. Uh, philosophers have argued about the meaning of good and evil for millennia. Yeah. <clears throat> and they will continue to. Uh, even for everyday concepts, the linguistic parts are crisp and conscious in every child's mind, but it will take the rest of the child's life to acquire equally crisp and conscious cognitive models. Perfect example. Uh, it is likely the most caught that is likely that most cognitive concept models never attain equally conscious and crisp states. That's also very fucking interesting. Okay. The dual model is fundamentally important for the emergence of the hierarchy of the mind. Learning should be grounded in experience. Okay. But concept models of cognition are grounded in the experience only at the lower levels of concrete objects. 
at this level, human abilities are no different from that of animals. All right, let me read that again. Concept models of cognition are grounded in experience only at the lower levels of concrete objects. Okay, at this, which, which is an important level still. At this level, human abilities are no different from that of animals. Okay, the, the ability of experience, we basically have the same level of understanding as animals do at the base level of experience. Not necessarily how we interpret the experience, but at that level of experiencing. Okay, that makes sense. Explains, explains why I'm such a fucking dumbass. Um, understanding situations and abstract concepts cannot be based on experience alone. The referenced publications discuss in detail why this is impo why this is impossible. There are simply too many combinations of objects and events, more than all elementary events in life of the universe. Uh, a life's experience would never be sufficient to learn which combinations are meaningful in order to form abstract concepts. A life's experience would never be sufficient to learn which combinations are meaningful in order to... Okay, that makes sense. We have to kind of fill in the gaps for ourselves, logical gaps. Um, or rather, we fill in the gaps with logic, not that there are logical gaps, although there could be, but that's a different story. Um, cognitive models at higher levels are learned based on both life experience and language models. Cognitive models at higher levels are learned based on both life experience and language models. La that makes sense now. Okay. Language hierarchy is learned ready-made from the surrounding language at an early age. During the rest of an individual's life, knowledge instinct drives the mind to learn the cognitive hierarchy from life experience in correspondence with the language hierarchy. Uh, during the rest of the individual's life, knowledge instinct drives the mind to learn the cognitive hierarchy from life experience in correspondence with language hierarchy. I think I, I think I get what he's saying there. Uh, cognitive models are grounded in language. Cognitive models are grounded in language. Interesting. Okay. Differentiation and synthesis. I'm going to need a quick uh, break from reading just to kind of let that digest a minute, but I'm going to pop back over to chat. This is super fucking interesting stuff. I still have no clue how this relates to music other than the first paragraph where he says music is a, 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 a compensatory to, um, to resolve the dissonances of such an evolved language. Birds communicate, but they don't use language to communicate. That's that's not inherently true, Kevo. Sci scientifically, they don't use language the same way that I just read how we interpret language according to that paper. Animals do not do that. That is not the case. We we are the only animals that use actual language that have like concrete meanings to things. Animals can definitely communicate with each other with sound, but it's not really language in that sense. It's, it's, they don't have the, the level of cognition. Ugh. Good to see you guys discussing, though. I find this highly interesting. Primates can be taught sign language. Yes, I agree. Maybe this relates to music somehow. Well, parrots are, are mimicking sounds. That doesn't necessarily mean they're mimicking language. I mean, maybe primates are the exception, but we really don't even know how much primates actually understand sign language as a language so much as a cause and effect. I'm just saying... It's very interesting, definitely. Obvious, obviously, we're all aware that primates are in a, an evolutionary middle ground. What do you mean language is universal, music is not? What are you talking about? <laughs> what, what, are you, what are you referring to?
Uh, I've seen videos, or I've even seen in real life myself, animals reacting to music. I think there's something to that. But, I mean, it's not remotely the same way that we experience music. Oh, yeah. I used to have This Is Your Brain on music, and I have no idea what the fuck happened to my copy. It's somewhere. But, yeah, I was supposed to read that for uh, a psychology class, and I definitely didn't do it. I do need to get a copy of that, though. Yeah, it's a fucking... Brilliant, brilliant uh, book. Either way. All right. Let's hop back into it. I'm probably only going to go another 30 minutes because I'm going to have to eat after that and then do some more work. But, all right. Differentiation and synthesis. Learning within the dual hierarchy of the mind is driven by the knowledge instinct, which operates with two main mechanisms, differentiation and synthesis. Uh, referencing himself, nice, okay. At every level of the hierarchy, it drives the mind to achieve detailed understanding by creating more specific, diverse, and detailed concepts. All right. <sighs> this is the mechanism of differentiation. At the same time, knowledge instinct drives us to understand various situations and abstract concepts as a unity of constituent notions. The mechanism of knowledge instinct operating across hierarchical levels creates higher meaning and purpose. This is the mechanism of synthesis. All right, so basically, um, differentiation is, let's, let's go back here, level of the hierarchy. Drives the mind to achieve detailed understanding by creating more specific, diverse, and detailed concepts. All right. So by getting more diverse and detailed and specific about our concepts, that's differentiation. <coughs> but the um, the take taking the uh, okay taking the concepts and combining them into a higher concept or a different concept would be synthesis. Okay, that makes sense. When operating in the hierarchy top-down, knowledge instinct drives differentiation. When operating in the hierarchy bottom-up, it drives synthesis. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. Okay. Uh, the main tool of differentiation is the main tool of differentiation is language. Language gives our mind the culturally evolved means to differentiate reality in great detail. Okay. Language gives our mind the culturally evolved means to differentiate reality in great detail. This is not something that music does. Whoops. At least not in the semantic sense. And this is not something that animals are able to do. Period. So moving on from there. All right. The, the evolution of language required the neural rewiring of circuits that controlled vocalization. Interesting. Okay. The vocal tract muscles in animals are controlled from an old emotional center and voluntary control over vocalizations is limited. I didn't even know that. In animals, voluntary control over vocalizations is limited. Interesting. Humans, in contrast, possess a remarkable degree of voluntary control over their voice, which is necessary for language. Duh. In addition to the old, mostly involuntary control over the vocal tract, humans also have conscious involuntary control that... Sorry, hum... Oh, blah, blah, blah. Let me read that again. Sorry. In addition to the old, mostly involuntary control over the vocal tract, humans also have conscious voluntary control that originated in the cortex. Okay. So we have both. That's what he's basically trying to say there. The sound of an animal's cries engages its entire psyche rather than concepts and emotions separately. An animal call is part of the single concept emotion behavior vocalization psyche state. Uh, 
or psychic state here. Let's just Google that real fucking quick. No, fuck dictionary. This, the dictionary is not going to help us here. Uh, yeah. Uh, physics of the mind. Okay. Why isn't it able to find it? Okay, here it is. It just was a little different. Okay, so this is part of Perlovsky's fucking studies again. Okay. The calls designate with variant. Okay, where's that? Uh, hold on, let's go back up. Where the fuck is it? Okay. 2006A, all right. Towards physics of the mind, concepts, and emotions. Uh, yeah, see that. Uh, 22 to 55. It's not helpful. <sighs> uh, lame. All right, fine, whatever. I'm going to have to accept the fact that I have no fucking clue what that is right now because I'm not willing to go down that rabbit hole. But, okay. An animal call is a part of the single concept emotional behavior vocalization psychic state. Single concept emotion behavior vocalization. No clue what the fuck that is. I'm assuming that just means, like, they say one thing, and it's just like, ah! <laughs> I don't fucking know. I have no idea. Emotions, evaluations, and humans have, separate, have separated from concept representations and from behavior. The gradual differentiation of psychic states with a significant degree of voluntary control over each part gradually evolved along with language and brain rewiring. Uh, therefore, language contributed not only to differentiation of our conceptual ability, but also to the differentiation of psychic functions and concepts. Therefore, language contributed not only to the differentiation of our conceptual ability, but also to the differentiation of psychic functions of concepts, emotions, and behavior. This differentiation destroyed the primordial synthesis of the psyche. Interesting. With the evolution of language and human psyche, oops, the evolution of language, the human psyche began losing its synthesis or its wholeness. No shit. This is what he's talking about with the cognitive dissonance stuff. So animals have less cognitive dissonances than we do. No shit. Oh, damn. He said, this is cool, but where are references from all this stuff? He's, he's referencing his own work. That's, that's why. <laughs> he, he is the guy. He, he is the dude who's doing all this work. This is fucking cool. <clears throat> With the evolution of language, the human psyche began losing its synthesis, its wholeness. Whereas for animals, every piece of conceptual knowledge is inextricably connected to the emotional evaluation of a situation as well as to the appropriate behavior for satisfying instinctual needs. It is not so in humans. 
Most of the knowledge that exists in culture and expressed in language is not connected emotionally to human instinctual needs. But this tremendously advantage this is tremendously advantageous for the development of conceptual culture for science and technology. Huh. Okay. But there is a heavy price that humans pay for this freedom of conceptual thinking. The human psyche is not automatically whole. Human knowledge accumulated through language is not automatically connected to instinctual needs. Sometimes culturally developed conceptual knowledge contradicts instinctual needs inherited from the primordial past. Let me read that again. Human knowledge accumulated through language is not automatically connected to instinctual needs. Sometimes culturally developed con conceptual knowledge contradicts instinctual needs inherited from the primordial past. For example, culturally developed conceptual knowledge would be like, don't go and have sex with someone against that partner's will. That's a bad thing to do. Our primordial past would say, well, I'm just going to spread my seed to everything everywhere. And our culture says, don't do that. I mean, there's a good reason not, to, there's many good reasons not to do that. But, okay, this makes sense. Moreover, so by denying our base instincts, for whatever reason, you know, it could, could be multiple good or bad reasons. Moreover, various parts of knowledge may contradict the other. Moreover, various parts of knowledge may contradict the other, yes. Synthesis, the feeling of being whole, is closely related to the successful functioning of the highest models at the top of the hierarchy of the mind, which are perceived as the meaning and purpose of life. Therefore, contradictions in the system of knowledge, the, dis the disconnects between knowledge and instincts, the loss of the lost synthesis may lead to internal cries and may cause clinical depression. When psychic states missing synthesis preoccupy a majority of the population, knowledge loses its value, including the knowledge and value of social organization, leading to cultural calamities, wars, and destruction. The evaluation of Culture requires a balance between differentiation and synthesis. The evaluation of culture requires a balance between differentiation and synthesis. Interesting. Oh, sorry, not evaluation, the evolution of culture. My apologies. Interesting. Okay. Differentiation is the very essence of cultural evolution, but it may lead to an emotional disconnect between conceptual knowledge and instinctual needs to lost feelings of meaning and purpose, including the purpose of any cultural knowledge with, with a devastating impact on culture itself. Theoretical and experimental evidence suggests that different languages maintain different balances between the emotional and conceptual. Theoretical and experimental evidence suggests that different languages maintain different balances between the emotional and the conceptual. Wow. Fuck me. That's a lot to digest because he like he just spent this whole time building all of these concepts that are all like thicker concepts to dive into in and of themselves. Um, I have to go back through all of those on my own time. That's a that's a lot to take in. That's really fucking cool. And I mean, if, if you're wondering, yes, here's all of the fucking here's all of the references. He has his he has his references in here. How are we feeling over here, chat? Billy Bob, you you say a whole lot of conjecture. You literally haven't seen a damn thing of where his references are. This dude's from fucking Harvard, dude. <laughs> theoretical evidence you have no fucking clue what you're talking about like god bless your tiny heart for thinking you know so much here want to go through his references here is his fucking bibliography not to mention the decades worth of work of him referencing his own goddamn work he's been doing forever like holy shit like what 
What do you think this fucking is, dude? Oh my god. Here. Look at it yourself, and then, then you tell me about all the conjecture. Go for it. Otherwise, keep your awfully shitty opinions to yourself. Dear God. Empirical evidence and tests. Which apparently he has in part two, which never got fucking released. That makes me so upset. Uh, anyway. Alright, so that's about where we are, right? Differentiation and synthesis. We discuss the main hypothesis of the paper. All right, what time are we at right now? We did more reading for this paper than most people do in their lives. All right, we got about 10 minutes left. Uh You found part two? Can you pay? I mean, if you're, if you're actually being serious, can you please paste it in chat so we can take a look at it? I've been looking for part two forever. I've been seriously searching for about a decade for part two. Play some guitar, I'll probably suck at it, honestly. Let me see here. Hmm. Is this even in tune? This guitar, though. Fucking uh, Keith Mara signature. This thing's gorgeous. One second. You guys can hear that. Nice. Let down just a smidge. What key are we in here?
Yeah, I'm not feeling this at all. This is way too chill for me. <laughs> That's good practice, though. I normally, I, I have not improv in a long time, especially not to a song I'm not familiar with. practice right now it's about as much uh, guitar playing as you're gonna get out of me right now <laughs> he's more reverb definitely not that's plenty of reverb right there Probably one of the issues. Props way out right now, man. Uh, I'm just going back to shitty ass fucking licks. Yeah, these are terrible, terrible licks. I don't know. If it had more of a thing going on as opposed to just repeating, that's, that's another thing too with learning to improv. It helps a lot more if you have kind of like a um, concrete beginning and end instead of just something looping over and over again, if that makes any sense. Though it's also really good practice to, to um, what do you call it, to loop on things and try and keep up a continuous idea. Ovidas does that. He's, he's a lot better at it than I am. Yeah. Also, I don't have a shitload of, like, learned, over-practiced licks that I just toss out all the time. I have a handful of those, and they get used a lot. When it comes to stuff that I actually play, it has a lot to do with writing something on my hands and then learning it and reproducing it. Uh, I'm not much of an improver. Uh, our new Crusade single has some fucking weird shit on it guitar-wise. That song does not sound very difficult, but I challenge anyone to fucking learn that song. That song is a fucking bitch on the keyboards. That song is a fucking bitch on the guitar. It's not the world's biggest bitch on the bass, but it's not easy. Holy shit. Uh a clean sound. Uh, oh, you really like the clean. T you really like the clean tone. Nice. Yeah, it's a nice tone. I actually made it for the um, the Petrucci. Pop this guy out real quick. Oh, 
Whoop. Whoop. Whoopsie. Keep knocking my fucking camera around. that real quick. things I haven't practiced nearly well enough, but you get the idea. That's what that tone was made for, is to specifically bring out the, uh, the niceness of the piezo pickups. Sit real nice. You guys will like the new single. It's, uh, it's different. Familiar, but different. Anyway. All right. You guys take it easy. I'm going to get the hell out of here. But you guys peace out. I will uh, be announcing the release date of the new single very soon, actually. But, all right. Be good, motherfuckers. Take her easy. <laughs>